Evening, everybody. Glad to be back with y'all. Glad to be back in the pulpit up here this evening. Hate that my dad's still sick, but it gives me a chance to speak on something that I feel very passionately about, so I'm excited about that. But just real quick, so I'm only going to be gone for a couple months and everything, but essentially what's going to be going on is that I'll be up in St. Louis for two and a half weeks, and then they're sending me out to a job site that I have yet to know the location of, so that's essentially the gist of it. It's going to be with a paving company, so that'll be really cool over the summer, as y'all can imagine. So pray for my heat tolerance, please. But anyway, so instrumental music is what we're going to be talking about. And what I want to start with is that one of the first things that people notice is that we do not use mechanical instruments of music in our worship. It seems strange to a lot of people because they're very commonly used in other churches. So people wonder why we don't use them. I was dating a girl a little while back, and one of, that's one of the first things that we ever talked about. She grew up in a Baptist household and was raised playing piano. And earlier on in the relationship, I got a text from her while I was working over the winter break saying, we need to talk. And guys, you know, those are the four scariest words that you can ever hear from a woman. And so my crew, after I got those anxiety-inducing words, my crew went on break, thankfully, and I called her. And she wanted to inform me that even if she ever started to go into a church without instruments, she would not be giving up piano. She wanted to play it. She loved it. And I said, look, no one is asking you to give up any instruments. My sister played piano, and I was in band and played saxophone. There's just a difference, though between worship and entertainment. That helped calm her down a little bit. I also hit her with the, just calm down a little bit. That really helped as well. <laughs> People get defensive about their worship. And I can honestly say that in the past year, I have had just as many conversations about salvation as I have worship. But of course, people want to know, why don't we use instruments in worship? Everyone else does. And they just sound so pretty, you know? It just really makes you feel spiritual. And something that pretty, surely God would approve of them. But it's not about making the prettiest sounds or what even the impression is that it leaves on other people. If you give something to someone, don't you want to make sure that it's something they'll actually want? Something they will like? And in a similar fashion... When we offer our worship to God, shouldn't we make sure that it's something that he wants? I also want to preface that we don't use instruments because we can't afford them. And that's not the reason why first century Christians didn't use them either. The reason we do not use mechanical instruments of music in worship is because we do not have authority from God to do so. That's the summary of what our lesson is going to be for the rest of the evening. But anyway, what I want to start with, though is that it surprises a lot of people is what surprises a lot of people is that nowhere does the bible authorize the church to worship god with a mechanical instrument of music you can search throughout the bible and you will not find even one verse that authorizes the church of christ to worship god with a mechanical instrument of music there is no example or hint that the church of christ you read about in the bible ever worshiped God with mechanical instruments of music. And I'll preface with, we get the name Church of Christ from Romans chapter 16 and verse 16. That's not just some man-made title that we came up with. That is how Paul addressed the Christians in Rome. The idea of the church worshiping God with a mechanical instrument of music was entirely unheard of, though. It is a matter of historic record that the Church of Christ did not use, use instrumental music in worship. One theologian said, let the pipe be resigned to the shepherds and the flute to the superstitious who are engrossed in idolatry. For, in truth, such instruments are to be banished from the banquet. And another one, the one instrument of peace, the word is what we employ. We no longer employ the ancient psaltery and trumpet and timbrel and flute. That was Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215 AD. The American Encyclopedia, volume 12, page 688, states, Pope Vitalian is related to have first introduced organs into some of the churches of Western Europe around 670 AD. But the earliest trustworthy account is that of the one sent as a present by the Greek emperor Constantine 
to Papen, King of the Franks in 775. The Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 1702, states, In the Greek church, the organ never came into use, but after the 8th century, it became more and more common in the Latin church, not, however, without opposition from the side of the monks. The Reformed Church discarded it, and through the Church of Basil very early introduced it, it was in other places admitted only sparingly and after long hesitation. And then another one. For almost a thousand years, Gregorian chants, without any instrumental or harmonic addition, was the only music used. And that's from the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 10, page 657. I know, that was a lot of references, but it's to drive the point home that it surprises a lot of people when the various religious denominations were formed, many of their religious leaders were opposed to the use of mechanical instruments in worship. Uh, Martin Luther, reformer and founder of the Lutheran Church, said the organ is the, in the worship of God is an ensign of Baal. Another one, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things, from the Jews. And that was John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterian Church. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, said, I have no objections to the instruments in our chapels, provided they are neither heard nor seen. Productive of any good in the worship of God, and I have only reason to believe that they were productive of much evil. Music as a science I admire and esteem, but instruments and music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music, and here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity who requires his followers to worship him in spirit and in truth. That was Adam Clark, Methodist scholar and commentator. One more, Charles Spurgeon one of the most prevalent Baptist preachers quoted 1 Corinthians 14, 15 and added, I would as soon pray to God with machinery as to sing with God with machinery. It can be readily seen that the Church of Christ is not alone in its opposition to the use of mechanical instruments in worship to God. And that history shows, without a doubt, that instrumental music is an addition to the worship of God. Church founders, encyclopedias, Scholars, commentators, reformers, and historians all agree and point to the fact that all of the passages that deal with music in the worship of the church use the word singing or sing or fruit of lips, except for Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, which reads making melody. Other than that, we really have no inclination that anything was used other than singing in our services. There's a translation of the Greek word solo used in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Paul writes, he says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a translation of the Greek word solo. It was synonymous with the word sing, and it's translated so in all the other passages where it is used. If there be any argument about this word, Paul tells us what we are to solo, what we are to pluck. Since Paul is giving a command here, it had reference to playing a mechanical instrument of music. If it did, we would all be obligated to do so. It would not be optional, but mandatory for every Christian. The early church did not understand it this way, as they never worshipped God with a mechanical instrument, as we have no record of early Christians worshipping God with a mechanical instrument. Therefore, instrumental music in worship is an addition to the word of God. From passages such as Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, chapter 12 and verse 32, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, if you want to go ahead and turn to Revelation 22, we will read that verse. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. This is the ending of Revelation. And the author writes, he says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. 
it's kind of a scary passage, and I do not want the takeaway of using Revelation 22 to be that Christianity is a legalistic approach to salvation. It's not, but there are definitely some things to keep in context about how we worship and how we approach God whenever we are assembled together. But in Revelation chapter 22, we learn that God would not have us to add to his word. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, Learn not to go beyond the things which are written. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul admonishes, he says, Teach no other doctrine. And remember, whoever goes onward and abides not in the teaching of Christ has not God. But that's enough on dealing mostly with what other men have had to say. We dipped in a little bit what John has to write, and well, what Jesus says here in Revelation, talk a little bit about what Paul has to write, but I really want to focus more on what the Word of God has to say about this. What does the Bible have to say about worship and singing? Are there any scripturally authoritative verses in the Bible for 21st century Christians that say that we can use instruments to worship God? The long and the short of it is no, there isn't. Under the Mosaic law, instrumental music is authorized for the Israelites. But so is a cappella singing. So I want to read some verses on worshiping God and what we are told, starting out with Psalm chapter 68. Psalm chapter 68. Verses 4 and 5. Psalm 68, 4 and 5, sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then finally, James chapter 5 and verse 13. James chapter 5 and verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So obviously, we have four verses out up here. We did not read all of them in order, but I want to point out that we threw psalms in here just to make a point. The point being that even in the Old Testament, a cappella singing was an acceptable form of worship to the Lord. No one can tell you that what you are doing is wrong or sinful because we worship with a cappella singing. But so many in Christendom have taken the stance that the silence of scriptures is permissive, not prohibitive. And ultimately, this is the tip of the iceberg of that exact topic. Is the silence of the scriptures permissive or prohibitive? Thankfully, at Sutton Lane, we have a whole series of lessons that my dad taught and preached on that exact subject. And we could have a whole nother series on it, or at least one sermon on it, about the three different ways that we get our types of authority. But for the sake of brevity, I just want to read one verse about it. And that verse, just over a page in your Bible, is James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 10. He writes, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. To me, that's the long and short of it. So many people want to use instruments and justify the use of instruments because instruments were used to worship God back in the Old Testament. So the argument then is, well, it's in the Bible. The Israelites used it. They were God's chosen people. It should be fine, right? Well, the Old Testament also says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But we know from Jesus' teachings that that is not how Christians live today. And to push it even further, when you sin... Do you go out to your backyard and build an altar before the Lord and offer sacrifices of goats and bulls? Do you observe the Passover still? Do you keep the Sabbath day? Do you worship God on Saturday? Do you refuse to eat shellfish? All my hunters here. If you touch the body of the game that you just killed, 
do you self-quarantine for seven days? There's a million more rules and scenarios I could list, but my point is this. If we are going to keep instrumental worship, then you have to keep every single one of those rules and more. Because according to James chapter 2 and verse 10, if you're found guilty of one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole law. Because if you're found guilty in one of the area of the law, I, James says it as good as can be said. And that's exactly what Jesus came to fix. There is a reason why we call Christianity the law of liberty. Again, though, the Old Testament is written for our learning, but not for our law. Let me make sure I'm caught up on my PowerPoint. No. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. That's an unfinished PowerPoint. We'll just leave it on that one because it looks a little bit more professional. The Old Testament is written for our learning, but not for our law. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So going back to the Old Testament is helpful for study and an understanding of many things. But going back to the Old Testament for any practice obligates one to keep all of its ordinances. Galatians chapter 5 and verses 1 and 3. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, if you circumcise your kid whenever they're born, you're not condemning them with hell or anything. It was just for the sake of keeping with the Jewish practices that it was, this is what Paul's speaking to. But... That's it. It's about keeping the old law. How one approaches God in worship is of fundamental importance. Individually and congregationally, worship is either accepted or refused by God. And God made it abundantly clear to Israel just how he feels about such unauthorized worship in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. That's your cue to turn there, by the way. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Leviticus 10, the first three verses. The Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So. Nadab and Abihu took their censers to burn incense and worship to God. But on this occasion, they offered profane fire before the Lord. But what was profane about it? And it was just this. It had come from somewhere that God had not commanded. They had no authority to be doing what they were doing. If God killed Nadab and Abihu for presumptuously offering profane fire in the tabernacle of old, what will he do to those who presumptuously offer profane music in his church today? We're not talking about, you know, little bitty differences and like, I say little bitty differences. They're pretty big differences to some groups. But, you know, having a steeple versus not. Is somebody going to lose their soul over that? I don't know. This is just my opinion, but I don't think so. But all that to say, that is one thing. Our worship is another. Us coming before God and worshiping him as he would have us to, that is a big deal because we can point to Old Testament examples and see that it is a big deal. So, to wrap it all up, conclusion time. True worship is done in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, and verse 24. John 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Individually, God only accepts worship in spirit. 
that which comes from proper attitudes such as reverence, thanksgiving, humility. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. The writer says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We have to examine ourselves before worshiping. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Collectively, God only accepts worship in truth worship, which means according to his word. John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We have no authority to put words in God's mouth or to ignore words from his mouth. Romans chapter 4 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. But he being Jesus answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, fits in again very well to that. Man is not at liberty to select a worship form that appeals to him. The danger for any church is to make worship entertainment-oriented. The important thing is not what draws a crowd, but what pleases God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, just a few pages over. Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are a lot of people who put their whole heart into worship, and they truly believe that what they're doing is right, but Matthew 7 tells us that while they do what they felt was right, they put all their eggs into the wrong basket because there is a right way and a wrong way to approach God and in worship. Let's finish out that section right there. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There is acceptable and unacceptable ways to build a relationship with the Father and the Son. And the only way we are going to figure out the right ways to devote ourselves to the Word of God is through the Word of God and through take, talking to God in prayer, asking for guidance as we try and hear and understand Him. Just like with people, it's all about relationships. It's all about talking to somebody in order to figure out what they like, what they dislike, what they find acceptable, and what they don't. And that's one area that God is no different. We have to be in His Word we have to be talking to him through prayer like we were talking about this morning. There's a lot we can do in order to draw closer to God. And ultimately, that's the thing that matters the most is our relationship with God, our understanding of God's word, but also our attitude to how we treat the scriptures. We don't need to be hypocritical. We need to be in God's word. We need to make sure that we are testing what we do. It's okay to ask questions about why we do what we do, what we practice, and how we practice. God expects that of us, and he wants that of us. Test your faith. Make sure that you truly are committed, because that was, that's what God wants from us. God wants soldiers. God wants warriors. That's what we're compared to in the New Testament. This life is a struggle, but this life, this world, is not our home either. If there's anything that we can do for you tonight, if you have never put on God, Christ through baptism, if you've never entered into the fold truly and become a Christian, we would love to be able to help set you on the straight and narrow. But you have to put on Christ through baptism. You have to enter in through that death. That's the whole symbolism behind it, is that Christ was crucified, died, was buried, and rose from the grave. That's what we, what we do, what we symbolize when we are baptized. We enter into his family that way. If you are a Christian and have put on Christ in baptism before, you have fallen by the wayside. Please, let us know what you need. Let us know what you're struggling with.
The idea that hell is going to be burning torment is very accurate, of course. But to me, what terrifies me even more about the idea of an eternity in hell is that it is an eternity away from God's presence. We have no idea what that's going to be like. Play it safe. Make yourself right before God as together we stand and as we sing the invitation song. There's a great day coming.